want to uh, begin by welcoming everybody to our legislative luncheon this, this fall's edition, uh, sponsored by none other than Foley and Foley PC, your source for employment and labor counsel and advice. <clears throat> no uh, personal plug there. Um, well, I'm glad to see so many familiar faces uh, here today, but for those of you who do not know me, I'm Timothy Keneally. I'm the president of the chamber. And uh, at, uh, at the Tritown Chamber of Commerce, uh, we pride ourselves on being the voice of business in the towns of Mansfield, Norton, and Foxborough. And as part of our mission, uh, we endeavor to connect our membership with our local leaders and our uh, state leaders. And uh, joining us here today, um, we are pleased to have our uh, state representatives, uh, Jay Barrows, Betty Poirier, and Steve Howitz, as well as Senator James Timothy. Um, we're also pleased to have with us our town manager from Foxborough, Bill Keegan, our town manager from Mansfield, Bill Ross, and our town manager from Norton, Michael Units. Thank you for, all, for coming. Uh, and of course, um, I would be remiss if I didn't welcome our esteemed Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito, who will be speaking with, uh, to you later today in about 30 minutes. Um, now you can rest easy, I'm not going to fill that time, 30 minutes worth, uh, speaking to you today, but <clears throat> I did want to take a minute to uh, revisit our history, uh, the history of our legislative luncheons. Um, you know, since we began this series in 2011, we've had um, some great speakers come through, and uh, just wanted to list those to remind you folks of uh, who's, who's blessed us with their presence. Uh, Greg Bilecki was here in 2011. He was the then Secretary of Housing and Economic Development. Uh, Richard Davey spoke to us, and he was the Secretary of Transportation at the time. We had Steve Grossman, uh, then the Treasurer and Receiver General. And of course, we had Congressman Joe Kennedy come and speak to us. So we have a, a strong tradition here, um, and, and, and so it's with great pride that I, that I welcome our Lieutenant Governor today uh, to speak to us. Um, in wrapping up, I, I offer this. Uh, we have many members of the Board of Directors here, ambassadors, our executive committee. Um, so if you as a member have something that you need or want assistance with, or if you have an idea even for a speaker at one of these luncheons, I invite you to please come to the leadership, come to me, come to Kara Griffin, our executive director, or one of the members of the board. And, and have your voice heard. Uh, so we stand ready to assist you in whatever your needs are and whatever your, uh, your business requires. So thank you for coming today. Uh, enjoy your lunch. And uh, I know we'll be, all have a great speech today. And um, uh, we'll have an opportunity for people to ask some questions after the speech. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, I was just noticing when I first came in, the podium was here, and it was right behind or in front of that mirror. None of you now know that I have a bald spot. You would have <laughs> had it remain. Just a spot? <laughs> it's a landing patch. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's enjoyed their lunch here today. Um, it's truly a pleasure that we've been, enjo been joined by our esteemed Lieutenant Governor and all of you that have taken the time to come out. Uh, thanks to Tim Keneally and Foley and Foley for hosting the event and the Holiday Inn for the great food. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Representative Betty Poirier, Representative Steve Howitt, and Senator Timothy for coming out as well today. We all work together. Um, our interest is your interest, and we really um, we're not like Washington, D.C. Um, we're reachable, we chat with each other, and we really do uh, try to do what's best for all of our communities. 
Um, I'd like to also um, thank and recognize our municipal partners, uh, Town Manager Bill Ross, um, Mike Units, Bill Keegan, and Mary Beth Bernard uh, for also coming out today. It means a lot, and I'd also like to recognize Mark Logan from the Foxborough Regional Charter School that's with us today as well. To all the members of the Tritown Chamber, I want to thank you all for the many responsibilities that you uphold in our communities, for providing opportunities to over 34,000 employees in our labor force, in supporting the many community-wide initiatives that you involve yourselves in and ask your employees to join with you. All of you in the room today are key components to the economic growth and long-term health and stability of this district. As the community continues to grow and develop new businesses and jobs, our area unemployment rate sits now at 4.63% and will continue to drop well below the state rate. We don't often talk enough about the commercial strength that exists within our communities. Um, and I do like to mention our commercial strength. Uh, every year, over 13 million, with an M, visit Patriot Place, Xfinity Center, and the TPC uh, Boston, which this is the 13th year of hosting the Deutsche Bank FedEx Championship. And I hope all of you get a chance to go. They've got great grass there. Um, <laughs> I've often thought if I could make a six-foot patch to look anything like that place, I'd be remarkable. But it is, uh, it is beautiful. And all of these venues that I've mentioned provide not only entertainment for our visitors, but create revenue for our local communities through the many retail shops, restaurants that gain business in the area. And that's not to mention all the manufacturing, uh, the diversity of industries that uh, are here in our district. Um, the last fiscal year alone, our communities received over $1.5 million in revenue from the local meals tax. Um, keep in mind, though, the commitments to economic growth of the Tritown communities that you've all made, you assist our local government funding many town services, our schools, our recreational programs. The roles that all of us play as business owners in our communities don't go unnoticed. You're all vital components of the local economy here in the Tritown area. Our Lieutenant Governor knows how important the relationship between local communities and business is. Before her current position as the 72nd Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth, Lieutenant Governor Polito has built a strong career in public service. Beginning at the local government level, serving on the Shrewsbury Board of Selectmen, the Lieutenant Governor has extensive knowledge of the complexities of local government issues, especially in creating strong environments for local businesses. Her record in the 11th Worcester District is state representative and is a member of the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce as well as Corda 9 Area Chamber of Commerce are all proof of her commitment to supporting and growing businesses in our communities. We're fortunate to have her here today with us and we're certainly fortunate to have the Baker Polito team leading Massachusetts. And now I am pleased to introduce my friend and your Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito. Am I on a short leash with this? Do you need this for the camera? Okay, so I guess I am. All right, so it's great to be with all of you here. I was really looking forward to coming today. September 1st, my house this year gone by fast, not only for the Baker Polito team, but I'm sure for you. You know, when I think about September 1st, I think about sort of like a chapter, you know, to uh, open especially uh, starting the day being the first day of school for our children. Uh, my son Bobby is 12. Uh, he's, uh, you know, bye mom, please no pictures, you know, <laughs> don't stand with me at the bus stop, you know, but I got a picture and of course. And uh, my daughter Judy heading off uh, to fourth grade in Shrewsbury Public Schools. And, you know, I was sort of restless last night thinking about them and thinking about the school year and thinking about you know how many more times will I put them you know on the bus and get them ready for school and get the backpacks ready and I'm still in the lunch making mode too as mom and uh, you know it just kind of brings to you a, a you know a pause to say as we all do in life you work so hard at your your business at your career and at the same time trying to balance life uh, your family, things that you enjoy doing, and just making sure you're not missing those moments. So, you know, that's sort of a, a moment that started my day today, and uh, 
you know, I'm sure in your life, just cherish them. So, so uh, from there, I never thought it would be so exciting. I'll touch upon Mansfield in a minute, but uh, right before coming here, I had the opportunity to go to the TPC and speak to a, a great group of women. Uh, many of you maybe can enjoy yourself at that event sometime. But it was a power panel of women talking just about that topic, uh, you know, how to balance work life, you know, what are the barriers uh, to success, and how do you, you know, jump through those hoops and, and keep things moving. But before I got to the event, I said, you know, here we are at this major event here. In, in Massachusetts, well, in New England, in the world, and what we'll be watching it this weekend. I said, I wonder if I'll, you know, see anyone famous. You know, it's early on in the week, and I don't know, maybe, maybe. I mean, he, you know, obviously Jordan Spieth is pretty, pretty important, but you know, that would never happen, right? <laughs> right. So, so I'm sitting in the car, and I'm looking up, and I see a bunch of young guys get out of a car, and I said, gee a lot like this picture. So of course, being the lieutenant governor, I wanted to bring warm greetings and welcome to Massachusetts to Jordan Spieth, which I had the opportunity to do this morning. So uh, my friend was saying, this is your lucky day. You better get out there and buy a lottery ticket or something because things are going really good for you today. So that was really exciting to, to come to that. And, and to be here with all of you, I have had the opportunity to serve uh, with Representative Poyer and Representative Barrows and Senator Timothy, and being the newer one on the block there, Representative Howitt. Uh, and it's great to be able to come back into public life and serve as Lieutenant Governor. 20 years when I started my career as a selectman in Shrewsbury, I never thought I would be in this great place of honor to work alongside of Charlie Baker to make Massachusetts great everywhere. But having the experience as a former local official, you know, I see my friend uh, Billy Keegan here from our Shrewsbury roots, and remembering, as the governor does, how important it is to have good leaders on the local level, but also remembering, you know, the service that our colleagues in the legislature bring. You have a really good legislative delegation here. Uh, and I remember sitting in the chamber and, you know, we'd be there hours, you know, debating bills and budgets and just hearing about this area and how much it really has grown uh, in the past 10 years even is just amazing. Uh, and as we get around the state, we need to really understand what the vibe is, what is the asset in the region that can really be leveraged to help communities. And when you look at, you know, just today, like the weekend, you had Country Fest, you have the TPC, you have, you know, Patriots ready to take Gillette and Patriots Place, and it's just an amazing amount of asset that you have right here that is integral to your economy. And you obviously, you know that, and you need to, to keep it going. So I'm just happy to be here to engage in some conversation with you. I'll give you a few highlights about the last nine months just amazing, in nine months what can happen, right? Uh, you, as moms, you might know that's a powerful <laughs> amount of time. But certainly uh, in the legislature, having come in, I mean, it, uh, working with the legislature, coming into office, we wanted to set the right tone. And the tone uh, was important to us to make sure that we have a, a bipartisan spirit that we embrace. So by working with the legislature, a legislature that we honor and respect and know the value of was really important to us. Uh, there's nothing that comes in between the time that we have on Monday afternoons at 2 o'clock with Speaker DeLeo and Senate President Stan Rosenberg and our uh, team, just the governor and I and our Ways and Means Chairs, to really talk about the issues of the day, how do you feel about them, you know, how can we work together and, and get things done. And really setting that tone uh, early on was important, especially coming into office with a $760 million deficit for, the, for that current fiscal year that we were stepping into, and then knowing going into the next fiscal year another $1.6 billion deficit to have to balance. It was an experience that was difficult for all of us, but by being able to work together, we were able to rebalance those budgets, set the right priorities, maintain our commitment to cities and towns, and thank the legislature very much for increasing local aid for municipal services, increasing school aid so that schools are great everywhere in the Commonwealth, 
And then, of course, uh, making sure that the essential assets of government uh, work, uh, which was very important to us uh, after this winter when we discovered one essential asset of our Commonwealth that wasn't working so great. And to have gone through that budget process and have been able to work with the legislature to gain the tools that we needed to fix the T was really an historic moment uh, for Beacon Hill. And I want to thank the legislators here and all of our colleagues in the legislature for really stepping up with uh, Charlie and I and our team to get the tools to fix the T. Uh, the Fiscal Management Control Board has been staffed. It's, it's working. It will be releasing its first 60-day report on, on where things are. And they're literally just drilling in every day, focused like a laser beam on the operations of the T. It has to work. You know, people rely on the T to get to work, or a medical appointment, or a young professional to start a career, or, or, you know, kids to get to school. It has to work. And so, Having that tool, uh, having that control board is very, very important to us. Uh, of course, being able to relax what is known as the Pacheco Law to give us some flexibility and being able to uh, pr pr provide services more efficiently and overall have a quality system is very important. And that was also historic, giving us three years to work uh, you know, through and around the Pacheco Law. It was, it was critical. So. Uh, stay tuned on, on the T. Uh, we will keep working at it along with preparing for the next winter, which is just a few months away. So the winter resiliency program, uh, we're, we're testing it, we're working it, we've got a plan, and the true test will be this winter. Now, I've heard a lot of different predictions about this winter. Uh, some say the Farmer's Almanac says it's going to be pretty severe, although uh, the governor says we won't have another winter like this for 26,000 years. So I am holding Charlie Baker to that, okay? And you will with me as well. A couple of other things in the budget that were really important uh, also were was relative to an issue that is important to all of us. It's a crisis. It knows no boundary whatsoever, and it's impacting every single community in our, our Commonwealth, and that is the issue of opiate addiction. Uh, in our budget, we were able to include uh, funds uh, toward this, uh, we'll call it a, it's an epidemic, but we're gonna tackle it. And with our legislative colleagues uh, having funds in the fiscal year 16 budget, and also looking for additional funds in the supplemental budget coming up hopefully soon, we are looking to tackle the opiate addiction crisis from one end to the other. Meaning, when it comes to education in our schools and having a statewide curriculum at an appropriate age, which you know, was probably around my son's age, who's 12 years old. You know, who, all of us in this room, who would think we'd have to have a serious conversation around opiate and heroin and addiction at that age, but we need to. All right, so if we can do more on the curriculum and the prevention end so that we can save a generation, I think we've lost a generation uh, toward this epidemic. Uh, that coupled with funds uh, for more uh, recovery beds, long-term recovery beds, we're looking to ramp up two, 300 beds to not just have individuals in detox just for a short period of time, but in long-term recovery, so people in recovery can truly recover and not have to re-enter the system. And then, of course, the challenge to our medical community, which has embraced this challenge, to really educate uh, medical professionals at all parts of the system about what an opiate prescription should look like for that particular individual, really understanding an individual's history relevant relative to addiction and really making sure that we're not over prescribing or putting more people in harm's way by exposing them to an opiate in the first place. So we're working with our colleagues, we're, we're trying to tackle that, that particular issue. Uh, on uh, the community end, uh, being a, a former selectman and the governor as well, we campaigned on a very, very simple message. And the message was, let's make Massachusetts great everywhere. And we're going to do that by building stronger communities from the grassroots up. And this means, you know, as I said earlier, great school for your kids no matter where they live. 
anywhere in this Commonwealth, whatever school that they go to in that neighborhood is a great one. A safe neighborhood, a safe neighborhood to raise your family. And too much this summer, we've, we've really witnessed some hot spots in our state where there are, the neighborhoods aren't as safe as they should be. And that there should be jobs and opportunities everywhere in the Commonwealth. You shouldn't have to be commuting two hours or more to get to a great job closer to Boston. These jobs should be everywhere in our Commonwealth. And so in order to do that, uh, through the Community Compact Program, we feel will strengthen communities from the grassroots up and, and be able to, to create uh, a higher standard across all those measures. Just this morning, I started my, my day in Mansfield. I want to thank uh, the town manager for stepping up. You are the 16th community to sign a Commonwealth Compact, a community compact. And what this does is raise the bar. Like the governor and I said, too often we're hearing from town managers and local officials that how come this community is like not really making good financial decisions and it seems like the state's bailing them out. We should really work the other way. And if you see a community trending toward financial difficulty, help them. Help them embrace better practices. Give them the resources they need to establish safe, financial, you know, predictable uh, plans for the future, forecasts, and help them succeed. So by that thinking, we set up this program that encourages every single community, not just the large cities, not just suburban towns, but rural communities, smaller cities, every community in our Commonwealth to raise the bar. And through this Commonwealth uh, Compact, you can take advantage of the resources at our state level, you know, our technical assistance, our grant programs, to really help you achieve higher standards in your community for financial services, capital planning, uh, energy efficiency, you name it. It's your program, it's not a mandate. You decide what your future will be. So this has been a really great program. We've had over 80 communities uh, so far apply. That means like 175 best practices are in the, in the works <coughs> for achievement. And uh, Mansfield, congratulations today for being the 16th one to sign up. So now, some of you are like falling asleep. Is she really talking about community compacts? Yes, I am. And it may not be like sexy and exciting, but it's the bread and butter stuff that really will make this state shine from one end to the other. Because when you get out to places where I'm from, Worcester or Springfield and Holyoke and New Bedford and Fall River and even Brockton, these are areas that, that need a little bit more attention, a little more strategy and focus, and they've got all the right people leading that community with a little partnership and support from the state, they will get to the next level, and that's what we strive to achieve. Let's shift gears a little bit to the business side. I mean, I come from a family of business experience. My great-grandfather, Francesco Polito, came to this country from Sicily in 1909. 50 bucks in his pocket, 5'2", little guy, you know, but a big heart and a big spirit, and, you know, that work ethic drove him far. And he established a family business around construction, and then it kind of elevated into real estate and... We still have that business in our family today. And before coming into this office, I was able to manage that uh, business for my family. So I understand the real estate development market. I understand construction. I hold those licenses. And I bring you know, that business experience to my role. Uh, the governor brings that larger business experience to his role. And so what's important to us is in addition to building stronger communities, is to really establish a healthy business climate in our Commonwealth. And we just wanted to, early on in our administration, just you know, bust open the doors that Massachusetts is open for business. First and foremost, we start with the businesses that are here. Hello to the large employers. Thank you for being here. We need you to stay here, and we need to help you continue to grow and, and maintain jobs in the Commonwealth. And to our small businesses, a lot of whom are here today, you are the backbone of our economy. You are the bread and butter in every single community of, this, of, of our Commonwealth that is paying taxes, supporting the community, always 
participating in a charity or a volunteer effort, always giving back to community and really providing those jobs that you know keep families together and allow people to have a good quality of life. So one of the first things we did was to say, what, what do businesses, especially small businesses, detest the most? Regulation. Regulation, good answer over here. Regulation, right? So we said, well, when's the last time the state like really took a hard look at the regulations in Massachusetts? Can anyone guess? 1930. <laughs> Never. Well, it was about 30 years ago during the Weldon Salucci administration. So it was a good idea to do then, and it's a good idea for the Baker Polito administration to do now, is to really just take a, a check on all of them. There's up, upwards of close to 2,000 regulations. So we are uh, uh, taking a, uh, first of all, a pause on new regulations and taking a really close look at all regulations, whether they impact a municipality, a large or a smaller business. And we're putting them in buckets, you know, regulations that just have to stay because they have to stay because the federal government or it's just essential to uh, the public's well-being. But there might be a way to better implement that without over uh, taxing a business to have to comply with the regulation. And then there are regulations that are just so outdated that there is no useful benefit to them. And we put those into a pile to say, hey, to our legislative friends, let's see if we can sunset some of these. And to just really look at them in that context. And we're, we're going through that process. We're engaging the business community. Give us some feedback. Let us hear from you about regulations that you feel we should take a close look at and consider sunsetting or changing. And so feel free to call on any of us in that process. We expect to announce our full recommendations in the spring of 2016 on that front. I will say that um, also integral to our Commonwealth is to make sure that our infrastructure is well maintained. You remember Governor Baker when he was a candidate promised he'd do one thing on his first day and that was to release the hundred million dollars for our roads in the Commonwealth. Yes, another very sexy topic, right? But it's true, I was there when he, you know, before we took the jacket off, signed off on the hundred million dollars and we added 230 more million dollars to that. Music to your ears as local officials and as business leaders because when people come into a community, they want to see that the roads are well maintained, that there are sidewalks that are passable, that a community you know, looks like people care. And in order for it to look like people care, you need the resources to be able to do it. You know, not everyone has Gillette and TPC and the Xfinity Center in their backyard to bring in a $1.5 million in just meals tax. So you need to just really have a strong partner with the state to be able to make all of those ends meet. Uh, let me just touch on our approach to uh, the business development. As I mentioned to you, we want to make Massachusetts shine from one end to the other. But it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And so we have asked Secretary Jay Ash, and I know he's coming to visit some of you soon, uh, to talk about uh, you know, the, the train, to talk about other issues that are integral to this economy, and to really look at regionally, what are your assets and how can we leverage them to help you grow the jobs? And we're doing that in every region of the Commonwealth. Coupled with that, people, people, you know, a well-educated workforce is a huge asset across our state. I met um, a couple, there are educators in this room, right? You know firsthand. Businesses will come here to Massachusetts or stay here if they have access to a workforce that is skilled and can do the jobs right then and there that they are creating in their business. And actually, Massachusetts, as great as the ed education institutions are, people come from all over the world to go to our colleges and universities, we have a workforce skills gap. It, it, you, you ask yourselves, how can this be in Massachusetts? But it is, and it really has to be a conversation with the employers. Ask the employers, ask the business owners, what are the skills that you need in a graduate today or over the next 10 years that you can employ here in the Commonwealth? And we'll make them. We will graduate students with the right skills that fit your industry, coupled with the soft skills 
that really need to be emphasized. And I, I look at you as business leaders, and you know firsthand what I'm talking about. People that come prepared and ready to work, that are eager to work, that will stay over time, that are really you know, ambitious about work. Work works. It's the best social program there is. And we need a whole lot more of it in this Commonwealth from when one end to the other. Let me just close on uh, a part that is, um, oh, so back on that workforce, I, the piece I really wanted to emphasize is we have three secretaries that are working on that. You know, and this isn't typical of government where you have secretaries and agencies actually communicating with one another. Government tends to operate in these silos and one doesn't know what the other is doing. We're trying to break all that down. So we have three secretariats, education, economic development, and workforce development working together regionally around our state to just figure out that workforce skills gap. So we're excited about that as well. Let me just uh, close on this, on this part. Uh, I am I'm very interested in empowerment, in particular women, and it breaks my heart as a mom, as a, as a lieutenant governor, as someone that cares deeply about this commonwealth and her children. We have over 48,000 kids in the care of our state. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it that we have that number of kids in the care of our state. And when you think of it, you know, we are responsible for making sure that these kids are safe and they have access to a good school and access to opportunity. And that's a big number. And the only real way to help families in this state and moms and dads is for them to have a chance and for their kids to have a chance. And I think a lot of it is addiction to drugs. A lot of it is behavioral health and mental illness. And we really got to make sure that we can do everything we can on that level to help moms be moms and dads to be dads and not find themselves in a place where they can't care for their kids. And that's a daunting task. So, you know, empowering women to me is all about a physically safe place to live, so I'm doing a lot on domestic violence and sexual assault. And if a woman, a young mother, can find a safe place to live, then she needs to be able to figure out how she can provide and set a strong example for her child. And that means she needs access to education, she needs to have a certificate or a degree, and then she needs a job where she can help her family succeed in life. So on all those levels, we've got a lot of work to do. Our administration, yes, in nine months, has focused every single day as best as we can with our team. We have the right people in the right places. Governor always says people are policy, and he's right. And we're trying hard every single day. But we know we've got a mountain to climb on some of these big issues. Uh, and we'll work on it every single day, but we hope that in our term of office, from beginning to end, we make some significant strides in these areas. I will just close by saying again that it is quite an honor uh, to, to be here today. It's an honor to serve alongside a Charlie Baker. It's an honor to have a strong team in place that we were able to establish early on that helps, has helped us make some very good and important decisions this far, thus far. I'm honored to work with my colleagues in the legislature. They are truly our partners in government. And we come here with a message of thanks to you as employers, as uh, you know, business, as entrepreneurs, as business owners. You take the risk, you go to bed at night thinking about the next day and you worry, you sign the paychecks, you insure your corporation or your business, you know, you're doing a lot every day. We don't want to make it harder for you. We just want to be a strong partner with our business community as well so that you can create those jobs and opportunities that are so key to your community and to people's quality of life and stability. With that, thank you for your time, for listening, and I'd love to hear from you.
questions. This is not a shy bunch. Jay told me this is not a shy crew. Yes. Yeah, so law enforcement obviously is a very integral partner here. There's a number of things that they're already doing. Uh, first of all, uh, it sounds simple, but it's really important on the take back program. So medications that you might have in your house that just sit in your drawer that you really don't need, you can't put down the toilet, you got to get rid of them. Uh, police chiefs across our state have boxes that you can deposit those medications in and they will properly dispose of them. It's important because someone that is, in, uh, is, a, is suffering from addiction will find those. They will find a way to get those and it will just make it harder for them to recover. So use that program. Uh, emergency personnel on the local level are well equipped with Narcan. Narcan is saving lives but only temporarily, because someone that is in a crisis and is overdosing, Narcan will arrest that overdose and save them for that period of time. Our goal then is to get that person into long-term recovery so that they can get better, rather than having to go into an emergency, then released, and then this happened over and over again. And just recently, the Attorney General announced a bulk purchasing of Narcan to make it affordable for law enforcement to be able to have on, on hand to help. The other is, is we got to get the drugs off the street. I mean, heroin is $2.50 for a dose. So once the addiction forms, people, these are people that had jobs, these are parents, these are kids, these are people that were once functioning uh, good, decent people in our communities that once uh, addicted are uh, finding heroin and heroin laced with other substances is lethal. So we've got to get these drugs off the street and we're working very closely with uh, special teams through the state police and through local law enforcement to really target these hot spots in our commonwealth. There's just a few examples right there. Truly our partners, they're on the front lines. Yes different topic maybe I didn't touch on yes well you you did touch on um, being business friendly um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about you know how how did your Republican administration um, negotiate with a pretty staunch Democratic legislature uh, you know there's a lot of regulation that's just not real friendly to business and it's a struggle for business owners, you know, my frame of reference most recently is is the uh, the mass sick leave law, which is actually sort of punitive to employers that already had a pretty generous PTO policy. You know, it's not good for the business owner. It's not good for the employee either. Well, so the question is, how do we uh, sort of negotiate a Republican administration with a Democrat-controlled legislature? Uh, to uh, truly be a business-friendly state. Okay, so we're, we are doing that. The fact that we were able to rebalance fiscal year 15 and balance 16 budget, both with significant deficits without raising taxes on individuals and businesses in our commonwealth was a huge accomplishment. So the legislature got that. They know that raising taxes is a barrier to job growth in our commonwealth, so that, that was huge. The other area that I really believe we will be able to make some significant strides around is reducing the cost of energy in the Commonwealth. Energy costs are also a barrier to growth and a barrier to attracting more business to the Commonwealth. We are a very high cost state in which to do business, especially when it comes to energy costs. That's why the governor was in Newfoundland this weekend working with partners in Canada and the regional New England governors to explore how we can diversify the energy uh, supply here in our Commonwealth. That means we need to look at hydroelectric. That means we do need to expand the gas supply primarily through existing rights of way here in our Commonwealth in order to diversify and complement uh, the alternative energy supply that we have. 
So we are working very aggressively on all fronts. We just filed a, a hydro bill, a solar bill, and others that the legislature is now hopefully going to work closely with us to come up with something that will work. The other is transportation. Transportation, public transportation, people love it. A million people ride the T. Three million people pay for it. So whether you use it or not, you're paying for it. And it must work in order to really support the economy in Massachusetts. We worked very closely with the legislature to get the tools to fix the T. So those are three examples right there. We are a Republican administration working closely with the legislature to get some things done. Anything else? One more, right here. This is a, a comment rather than a question. Um, my company, Jack Homey Realtor, has offices all over this area, South Shore, Boston, and beyond. And um, I want to thank the administration because one of the areas of our company is um, Weymouth, Massachusetts. And our, there's a project there called Southfield, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. Yes. And that's been stuck for a long, long time. And it looks like with the new owners that are in, and they, re, re, I heard them speak at a, a Chamber of Commerce event last week. They raved about the administration, and in particular, um, Secretary Jay Ash, for the support that has been provided to move this forward, to provide housing, jobs, and opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment, and I'll close on this. Truly, this administration is looking at a regional approach across the state, so that as much as when you look at the price tag for the state of good repair of the T, $7 billion. You say, how are we going to get to the rest of the state? Well, we will. And we want to make sure that, for instance, like Southfield, that the MassWorks grant program, and Mansfield has an application for some of those funds, reaches Weymouth. And then some reach Mansfield. And some are in Worcester and Springfield. We've got to spread the state resources across our state strategically with our private partners to create that housing, make sure the infrastructure is in place for commercial industrial development. That's exactly what you're doing right here in the Tri-Town area. You've, you've got all those ingredients, but you need a good partner in the state that doesn't come heavy-handedly, but comes as a, a complement to the good work that you're doing. Thank you very much for your time. Keep up your good work. Happy September 1st, and uh, enjoy the TPC, the, L the PGA weekend ahead, and hopefully good news coming for the New England Patriots. Very good. <laughs>